When I'm in the hospital, I usually wander into the ICU to visit the various patients that I've looked after before and preview patients for when I'm on call. I frequently find myself at the end of a bed of a patient with whom I am completely unfamiliar. I have limited time to find out who this patient is, why they were admitted to the hospital in the first place, and how they ended up in the ICU, what happened in between, what their background medical history is, what clinical problems are keeping them in the ICU in order of magnitude, and what the plan is for that particular patient. It's all about gathering the history of a patient from whom you can't take a history. There's an art to it, there's a systematic approach to it, and this is how I do it. The Critically Ill Patient's History The four W's Who is the patient? Why are they in the ICU? What organ systems are involved? And where are we going? Welcome back. This is a series of tutorials that serves as an introduction to critical care. Previously I discussed critical care locations and the critical care team, what is critical illness and what is critical care, the concept of physiological reserve and how to identify the critically ill patient. In this tutorial I will discuss how to obtain an ICU patient's history. It may seem obvious, but if you're working in the ICU it is imperative that you know the patient's story, not just today or yesterday, but the whole story. And that may be going on for months and may be full of nuance. So you need to be able to take the information and assemble that story so that you can present the patient on rounds during handover or during patient discussions. Let's start with the scenario. You arrive at the ICU bed of Eddie. When you arrive at a bedside, you need to take in the scenery, have a good look around, stand at the end of the bed and observe. Now I'm going to leave a lot of that observation to the next tutorial. We can see Eddie here in the bed, but what we're going to do is close the curtains and find out all about him by taking a history. We're going to try and glean the typical information that you will need to do a basic handover in the ICU. Obtaining history in the ICU is not easy. The patients are rarely in a position to give you much information, so you need to utilize the knowledge base of the bedside professionals, the nurses who know a lot about the patients. They have to do detailed handovers from shift to shift, and the doctors who are already in the ICU and may have been looking after the patient for several days. The chart and the clinical information system should be interrogated, and a good doctor will often phone the family or the patient's GP to get more information. On occasion, I have hunted down the paramedic that brought the patient from home for more information. You try and get as much information as you possibly can from whatever source is available. Nevertheless, regardless of your source of information, it is important that you keep your mind open to alternative problems and diagnoses. For example, I have had residents presenting cases to me at the end of which I have constructed a therapeutic plan in my mind, but then having gone ahead and examined and assessed the patient myself, I have completely changed my mind about how to treat the patient. So when you get to the bedside, all of the information is there and you need to start building up a profile of your patient in your head. The first question is, who is the patient? This is the patient's biography. What is the patient's name, age, and occupation? Where is the patient from? Are they local? Are they from the region? Are they immigrants? Are they visitors or tourists? This does have an impact on the narrative. You also want to know how long this patient has been in the ICU. The duration of stay is really important. If the patient was admitted very recently, they are likely acutely critically ill and in the resuscitation phase. If the patient has been in the ICU for more than seven days, they are either chronically critically ill or they're in the recovery phase. And sometimes both of those phases are really long. Importantly, what is the nature of the patient that we're dealing with? Is this patient medical, surgical, obstetric, psychiatric, pediatric, etc.? If the patient is, for example, surgical, do they have emergency surgery? elective surgery or are they a trauma patient? 
Is this a medical complication that we've seen in a surgical patient? Now that you know who the patient is and why they came into the hospital, you've got to figure out why the patient ended up in the ICU and why they're still in the ICU. And sometimes this requires that you go back and read the chart and make a virtual story in your head before even engaging with the bedside practitioners. Often there's problems with timing and accuracy and sometimes the story is a little bit muddled. Sometimes there's been misdiagnosis. Clarity and precision is imperative here because you need to assemble a problem list so that you can make a very precise diagnosis and then a plan of management for the patient. Why is this patient in the ICU? There are two components to this. What brought them to the ICU in the first place? Why did the patient come into the hospital? Many patients are admitted to the ICU after they have been admitted to the hospital. The reason for ICU admission may be the same or it may be different. You need to know what brought the patient into the hospital in the first place and why they deteriorated to the point that critical care was necessary. The second question is, why is this patient in ICU right now? Most patients are admitted to ICU because they need life-sustaining therapies and there are a limited number of these therapies available. They may have come into the ICU, for example, because of a neurological problem. That's usually a low Glasgow Coma Score, which may be caused by medley problems or seizures. It may be a cardiovascular problem, either hypotension, arrhythmias, or blood loss. A respiratory problem, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, or airway obstruction or it may be a problem of the renal and electrolyte system, acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, acidosis, dysosmolality, or fluid overload. And that covers most of what you see. A patient with sepsis, for example, may have everything that you see on this picture. The next thing you need to know is, what has happened since the patient arrived in the ICU? Why are they still in the ICU? So the recent history lists the interventions and complications since admission. They may have developed an antibiotic-induced skin rash, acute kidney injury, myocardial infarction, runs of supraventricular arrhythmias, bed sores, hospital-acquired pneumonia, DVT, and most commonly of all, acute delirium. The longer the patient is in the ICU, the higher the number of complications. We also need more background knowledge. What background medical or surgical problems does this patient have? We need a list of underlying clinical conditions because sometimes these increase the risk of patients being in the ICU and staying in the ICU. The background history is critical. You need to know underlying diagnosis along with the age because that allows you to determine the patient's physiologic reserve. This informs the decision-making process. Are they likely to survive critical illness? It also helps resolve targets. If, for example, the patient has chronic hypertension that's poorly controlled, then a higher mean arterial pressure target might be required. If the patient is a heavy smoker, then they may have a higher PaCO2 target than a lower PaO2 target. At this stage, you've got a jigsaw puzzle that you've started to put together. You now need to go through the patient's various systems to figure out what problems exist in each system so that you can piece together a problem list for the patient. With that problem list in place, you can then start working out how to manage the patient. At this stage, we know the presenting problem that brought the patient into the ICU, but this may no longer be the major concern. Indeed, the patient may have multiple ongoing pathologies, and unless you identify each of these and list them in order of magnitude, you cannot formulate an effective clinical plan for the patient. So we need a problem list. The patient may or may not have a confirmed diagnosis. I think it's important that you don't hang your hat on a diagnosis until you are secure that that diagnosis is correct. So it's okay just to list problems, not necessarily diagnoses. As time goes on, the precision of your problem list 
may improve. For example, you may say that the patient has ventilator-dependent respiratory failure and leave it at that. You may tighten that up by saying leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome based on a low PaO2 FiO2 ratio. And then as time goes on, you may become more secure saying due to community acquired pneumonia, which is culture positive for Staphylococcus. And then you have a full diagnosis. But you're not gonna say that from the offset. You'll just say, well, the patient has vent dependent respiratory failure. Now let's look at the various different systems and the problems patients may have in each system. We start with neurologic problems. Sometimes the diagnosis is slow to emerge, so you will say the patient has a low Glasgow coma score. At the beginning you might not know the reason for it. It may be caused by traumatic brain injury and then you would specify the reason or the mechanism or the pathology, stroke and encephalopathy, encephalitis, meningitis, or maybe the cause is just uncertain. Maybe it's due to toxicology. The patient may have taken something. The patient has severe delirium with a Richmond agitation sedation score of plus something, and the patient is being treated with the following drugs. The patient is in status epilepticus, being treated with specific drugs with a known or unknown history of epilepsy. The patient has Guillain-Barre syndrome requiring mechanical ventilation being treated with plasma exchange. So you can see that in each case I've listed the problem and the specific intervention that the patient is getting for that problem. And that's important in critical care because if a patient has a problem and they need to be in the ICU, then we have to be addressing it in some way or other. What about respiratory problems? In general, respiratory problems can be either due to problems of the parenchyma or the chest or the airway. For example, the patient may have acute hypoxic or hypercarpic respiratory failure, in which case you might say ventilator-dependent acute hypoxic respiratory failure, or ARDS requiring prone positioning and neuromuscular blockade in addition to mechanical ventilation, or acute hypoxic respiratory failure requiring high flow or CPAP, or acute hypercarbic respiratory failure requiring non-invasive ventilation. You will note that I haven't used the terminology type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure as I personally don't like these terms. I find them confusing for people who are not brought up in a system that uses those. I prefer to be more precise. It's either hypoxia or hypercarbia. I don't know why it's so hard not to just use those terms. The airway problems may be airway obstruction requiring non-invasive ventilation. For example, acute severe asthma requiring high flow bronchodilators, corticosteroids, etc that may be triggered by something or other. Try to come up with a problem or the diagnosis and then the intervention and the etiology. Sometimes more precision is needed. The patient may have acute hypoxic or hypercarbic respiratory failure secondary to trauma with multiple rib fractures or pleural effusions or pneumothorax or abdominal compartment syndrome or multiple segmental pulmonary emboli. Cardiovascular problems. If the patient is hypotensive in ICU requiring therapy, then you really have to specify the cause of shock. For example, it might be pressor-dependent septic shock or pressor and inotrope-dependent cardiogenic shock. Please do not mix up the terminology for vasopressors that are drugs that bring up the blood pressure versus inotropes that increase the stroke volume for a given end diastolic volume. Cardiogenic shock requiring interaortic balloon counterpulsation or a ventricular assist device or equivalent, pressor dependent neurogenic shock, or fluid responsive hemorrhagic shock. Although rhythm disturbances causing hypotension are technically cardiogenic shock, nobody really uses that term. Generally, we describe the problem complete heart block requiring external pacing or temporary wire, fast atrial fibrillation requiring an amiodarone infusion runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia requiring whatever drug you might decide to use. And sometimes there is a specific problem. For example, the patient has saddle pulmonary embolism with right ventricular strain. The patient is having recurrent episodes of acute pulmonary edema due to diastolic heart failure, airway obstruction, etc. The patient is being monitored post drainage of cardiac tamponade secondary to a specific pathology. Renal problems. Again, with renal problems, 
you may or may not have a specific diagnosis or a cause and effect, but what you would usually say is the patient has acute kidney injury secondary to sepsis or rhabdomyolysis or prolonged hypotension requiring continuous kidney replacement therapy. You might also qualify this with on a background of chronic kidney disease. And that's important because that patient may not recover real function. Or the patient has dialysis dependent acute kidney injury. He receives intermittent hemodialysis for three hours each day. If the patient has recovered from needing dialysis, you might say acute kidney injury no longer requiring kidney replacement therapy. So that you framed that the patient had gotten it at one stage but is no longer receiving that therapy. Endocrine and electrolyte problems. Most electrolyte problems in critical care are acquired. Now sometimes patients come in with these but a lot of them are acquired and they're part of the problem list. These are dysnatremias, hyponatremia, which is rarely acquired in the ICU, hypernatremia, which is commonly acquired, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, seen all the time, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, requiring four hourly replacement. There may be a precise diagnosis. This patient has multiple electrolyte abnormalities that are being caused by a high output stoma. The other major electrolyte and fluid problem is fluid overload. It's important to say that the patient is fluid overloaded and I would always qualify that. I would say this patient has a positive balance of six liters over the past six days. If you say the patient has a positive balance of six liters and they've been in the ICU for 40 days, that really isn't fluid overload. It's really a lot of fluid in a short period of time. Gastrointestinal problems. There may be a headline diagnosis like pancreatitis, bleeding esophageal varices, small bowel obstruction, etc. But there are all kinds of other problems with the gastrointestinal tract that you see in ICU. For example, gastroparesis, ileus, small bowel or large bowel ileus, diarrhea, constipation, malnutrition. And these are all worth listing. Sometimes patients have multiple GI things. We don't really know why patients get ileus in critical illness. It's part of the paradigm of multi-organ dysfunction. So you might just say the patient has an ileus and leave it at that. And certainly it is contributing to malnutrition. Neuromuscular problems. It's really important in the ICU that you identify if the patient has a problem moving their limbs or with their speech. If you identify a neuromuscular problem, you must present it so that it's not forgotten, particularly if the patient is being deeply sedated. For example, a hemiplegia, paraplegia, difficulty speaking, difficulty swallowing, palsy of the bulbar muscles or ocular palsy, and particularly critical illness polymyopathy. If the patient is very, very weak and they have sluggish reflexes and poor tone, they have a polymyopathy and that will delay recovery from critical illness and it may slow down liberation from mechanical ventilation. Skin and extremity problems. In the extremities we look for things like limb ischemia, edema, upper limb, lower limb, unilateral, bilateral, a skin rash which may be local or general, a wound infection or wound dehiscence, bed sores. These are all things that need to be listed. Hematological problems. The patient may have been admitted with a hematology issue like thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura or may have a complication of chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation. Otherwise, there will be anomalies on the patient's blood film. They may be anemic, it's commonly seen in ICU often, iatrogenic from blood draws, there may be polycythemia. Commonly, particularly in sepsis, we see thrombocytopenia. And again, this needs to be identified if the platelets are falling. It's part of the SOFA score indicating progression of critical illness. Infection problems. Infection may be the primary problem or it may be secondary. For example, you might say the wound is contaminated with VRE or pseudomonas or the patient may have acquired MRSA or the patient may have to be isolated due to CPE. But it's important that infections and contaminations are identified and put as part of the problem list. And finally, 
you also need to mention resolved problems because nothing is ever truly resolved. There's often some lingering organ dysfunction. If the patient was admitted with sepsis, source control may have resolved the problem. An underlying cardiac issue may have been fixed by a stent. An obstructed bowel or a leaking aneurysm may have been surgically repaired, but you need to know that they've had surgery. You think you're treating a patient for pneumonia and then you pull back the, the patient's gown and there's a big incision there and you go, hello, nobody told me when we were rounding earlier on that this patient had surgery, what's going on here? Acute kidney injury may be resolved, but again, there may be lingering renal damage. And don't believe for a second that someone who was on continuous kidney replacement therapy last week has normal GF4 this week, just because they're making urine and clearing creatinine. And I often wonder, is anything ever fully resolved before the patient has been discharged from hospital. It's important once you've put all of that stuff together that you also identify the physiological targets for each one of the patient's systems. We measure what we value so that we can set our targets. Neurological system, a RAS score or GCS score, depending on whether the patient is sedated or not. The respiratory system, PaO2, saturation, PaCO2, respiratory rate, cardiovascular system, blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, mean, heart rate, stroke volume, stroke volume variability. The gastrointestinal system and nutrition, enteral feeds, what's our target, bowel motions, TPN, etc. Renal, urinary output and fluid balance. The electrolytes, where do we want to see the electrolytes? Sometimes we might want a higher magnesium and potassium than the so-called normal limit on the biochemistry panel. The blood glucose, the extremities, how much we want to mobilize them and what we want to do with them. Presenting the history. If you're presenting the patient's history without the examination and all of the data, you should not need notes to do this. You should be able to rattle off the background story, the reasons for admission, all of the systems review, and the problem list off the top of your head. That's because you should know your patient. The way to do this is to follow the system that I've just described. Who is the patient? Why are they in the ICU? And what are their problems in order of magnitude? Remember, that's our biography, the type of patient, the duration, the hospital presenting problem. The ICU presenting problem and why they're still in the ICU. And baseline medical problems and of course that full-on problem list. So this is how one might present such a patient, starting with who. This is Mr. Eddie Chambers. He's a 73-year-old retired farmer from Mayo. He's a medical patient and he's been in the ICU for four days. Having originally been admitted with acute hypercarbic respiratory failure secondary to pneumonia. He was admitted to ICU for intubation and mechanical ventilation and subsequently developed septic shock and acute kidney injury requiring pressors and renal replacement therapy or kidney replacement therapy, depending on how you describe it. He has a background history of hypertension treated with calcium channel blockers. His current problems are ventilator dependent respiratory failure pressor-dependent septic shock, and dialysis-dependent acute kidney injury. He's also malnourished due to gastroparesis, hypoalbuminemic, anemic, and has a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and stress hyperglycemia. He also has a early sacral pressure sore. In terms of the goals of therapy, neurologically, we're going to sedate the patient to a RAS score of minus 2. Try and reduce the vent settings, that may be pressure support or respiratory rate. We may change the patient from a controlled mode to a spontaneous mode. Keep the PaO2 above 8 kilopascals and 60 millimeters of mercury. Keep the PaCO2 between 5.3 and 6 kilopascals, 40 to 45 millimeters of mercury. A mean arterial pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury given his history of hypertension. A fluid balance of minus 1000 mils today on kidney replacement therapy. We're going to start TPN today while simultaneously targeting a blood glucose of below 10 millimoles per liter or 180 milligrams per deciliter. He also needs to be mobilized, so we've asked the physiotherapists and the nurses to sit him out in a chair today. So, all of that is easy peasy. The key thing 
is that you have some form of structure for how you put together the history and present the history. So let's quickly review this tutorial. In this tutorial, I discussed how you get a history in the ICU and you follow four W's, who the patient is, why the patient came to hospital and why they needed to be admitted to ICU, what is currently wrong with the patient, a problem list, and where are we going with this patient, what are our goals of management. In the next tutorial, I'm going to cover physical examination of the patient in the ICU. This also needs to be systematic. We're going to marry the exam to the monitoring and data of that patient and then I will go through how you do the big presentation where you put the history, the exam and the data together. I'll see you then and I guarantee you learn something. So that's how to get a history about an ICU patient from whom you cannot take a history. Next time we'll talk about physical examination in the ICU. If you're enjoying the tutorials, please subscribe, give me some likes, make some comments, and tell some of your friends about these tutorials. I'll see you soon.